What a beautiful way to begin the service with a picture of salvation in baptism. What a wonderful thing it is. Baptism is something that is uh, so important. God, Jesus Christ said it as an example himself when he was baptized. Salvation begins when someone believes in Jesus. And because of this belief, they repent of their sins. They ask the Lord to forgive them of their sins. And then they choose to make Jesus the Lord of their life. And when they do that, God will accept their offer of their life and He will save them. Not because of anything good that they've done, it's by the grace of God. As we have faith and trust and belief in Him. By faith, we, though we haven't seen Him, we believe and we give our life to Him. After a person saved, they make a public profession of faith. Jesus made it very plain. He said uh, in, in Mark 8, 33, If you are ashamed of me in this adulterous and sinful world, I will be ashamed of you when I come in the glory of the Father. Right? So if you give Him your heart and your life, he is nothing to be ashamed of. Paul said it in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. A public profession of faith is important. And that's what we saw Greg and Megan and Reagan do today. They follow in believers' baptism. Yes, it is a symbol, but it's a symbol of what Christ did for us and what we should do with Him. We must die to our way. And we must follow His way. The old life has to pass away. Behold, all things become brand new. So we begin a lifetime of following Christ. Not always perfect. Not always perfect. Sinners saved by grace. But we yield, we give, we surrender. He's Lord, He's Master. Now I'm going to say something, I hope you take this and I hope you hear it well. It's not, an, Christianity is not an add-on to your life. It's not an add-on. It is your life. You turn from your life and you accept Christ's life. You turn from what you can do and you receive what you can do through Christ who strengthens you. It's not an add-on. To receive Christ, you've got to repent. You've got to believe and you've got to surrender. So many people, and I think it's sad, and I think it needs to be mentioned and boldly said, they say, oh, I, I, I'd like to have Christ, and I'd, I'd like to go to heaven one day. So they say, yes, I, I believe in Jesus. I believe He left heaven, and I believe that He came down, and I believe He died on the cross, and yes, I believe that He rose again. Even the demons who saw him before Genesis 1-1, who were called angels at that point in time, they believed those things. That doesn't mean that they were believers in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. It means more than just a head knowledge. It's a, it's a as Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And to do that, you can't just say, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to have my... I'd like to have a little salvation. I'd like to have a, a little bit slice of heaven and keep your old life. That's not how it works. It's not how it works. Matthew 6, verse 24. Kale, can you put this up? This is in the Sermon on the Mount. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other, you cannot serve God and mammon. The word mammon there sometimes is translated money. 
It means so much more than that. It means the things of this world, the riches of this world. Literally, this is the definition of it. The riches of this world where it is personified and opposed to God. There's God's way, and there's the way that we want, what we want. There's what God has to offer, and there's what the world has to offer. So if you want a little slice of heaven, but you would like to remain in charge while you're here on earth, can't happen. Can't happen. That's not salvation, folks. It's not an add-on. If you want to have a relationship with God, He wants to give that to you. It's not hard. It's not difficult. But it's real. The picture of baptism that we saw this morning is a glorious picture. It's a picture of the death going under the water, the burial being there, and raised to walk in newness of life. That's the cross. That's the picture of the cross. If you have your Bibles in Luke, excuse me, in John chapter number 12, this is, this is Palm Sunday today. These are things that happened that last week. After he entered into Jerusalem that last week, he did some teaching there. This is what it says in John 12, verse 20. There were certain Greeks among those who came to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, he was one of the disciples, who was from Bethesda of Galilee, and they asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. Hear Jesus' reply. Jesus answered them and saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Did you hear that? Glorified. Jesus came to live, to die, and to take back that life so that the plans of God can be lifted up so that Jesus can be glorified from the Father. We serve a great Savior, and He deserves a hallelujah. He deserves honor and praise for all that He did. Undeserving that we are. But oh, how freely it was offered and offered in love. But then He says this, verse 24, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. That's life, folks. You take that seed and you just set it there and it just stays there on a table. That's all you got is one seed. But if you bury it, the germination of life will come and it will sprout. And life will push through. And it will grow, not just to be a seed, but a stalk. And fruit will come from that. Not just one, but a hundred. Or a thousand. Or ten thousand. He says, most assuredly, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone unless you come to a place and time in your life when you know that you can't do it. There is no goodness within you. You cannot please God simply by how you act. You must trust and believe and allow God to do for you. Change your heart. Save your soul. Make you a new life. A heaven-fit life. A pleasing life. Only through that. But if you do, life will germinate within you and you will be resurrected to live a life here. But how many of y'all know this life here is not forever? One day I'm going to breathe my last breath here and I'm going to breathe my first breath there. I don't care if it comes to the avenue of death. I'm not scared of that. I, I, folks, I'm not going to be here forever. Uh, people say, oh, we were talking about it this morning. And, and, and we said, oh, this person's had a family member that lived to 102 or 104. And I'm like, I don't want to live that long. 
I, I already kind of walked like an old man. I don't want to be that. Amen? I, I, take me home, sweet Jesus. I don't know when that day's coming. You don't know when that day's coming, but I'll tell you one thing, I'm ready. Because when I breathed my last breath here, God promised. Because I gave my heart and life to Him. Because I seek to follow Him. Because He is my all in all. I don't trust in how good I am. I trust in the work of Christ. And I am whole and complete in Him. He says in verse 24, if you don't give your heart to Him, it remains alone. But if it dies, if it dies, it says it produces much. He who loves his life will lose it. I cannot tell you how many times people have, have felt the calling of God. I've seen it. I've witnessed to people. I've talked to them. I've been as kind as I knew how to, to talk to them. I cared for them. It grieved my soul when they would not turn loose. Because the only way that you can find the beginning of God is to find the end of yourself. And when you find the end of yourself and understand that, that, that that's a dead end and you need God to save you. But I'm here to tell you, if you hold, if you're embarrassed, if you're afraid, that's all you're going to have is nothing. But he who hates his life, who, he who's willing to turn from our way of thinking in this world will keep it for eternal life. Verse 26, if anyone serves me, let him follow me. Where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. The cross is the greatest example. It's the greatest example. He left heaven to be our sacrifice. He loved like no other. He came and he preached the truth. And he lived the truth. He built some lasting moments with people. He cared. He touched lives. Individual lives. Every person matters to him. He gave his life a ransom for sinners. He sacrificed so that we may live. He was taken for no sin that he ever did. The people who should have honored him and praised him mocked him and yelled, crucify him. He was beaten. He was slapped. They pulled out his beard. They spat in his face. Every kind and precious thing that he did was ignored. And that old sinful self hated the one who came to save their soul. I wonder how Jesus felt when the crowds shouted, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. I wonder how he felt when Pilate was willing to give a rebellious soul, Barabbas. But they said, no, 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 free him. Kill Jesus. He knew that man on his best day was broken. And yet he willingly gave his life. The soldiers took him back, made him naked, put a red, red uh, scarf around him, a robe around him, put a thorn, long thorns on his brow, shoved it down, took a, a, a rod and beat him with it, pushed it down upon his face. Isaiah prophesies in the Old Testament that, that Jesus was, was beaten like no other, that he probably lost his sight there in at least one of his eyes because probably one of those thorns pushed down and into his eye. Yet he opened not his mouth. He allowed it. He was scourged with a cat of nine tails. They tied him there. They whipped him there by a professional who knew how to do it. They pulled the, the skin, the sinew, the, the muscle from his back. 
He never yelled. He never said stop because of love. It's not just that he came down and said, let me just check in, I'll save you, and check out. He yielded everything for us. It all. But before the cross, he met with his disciples in the upper room. And there they were to take the Passover. That had happened all those years earlier when they were in Egypt. The Passover, which is the picture of what Christ would do. Come on the 10th day, held to the 14th day. The one without spot or without blemish would be killed as a sacrifice. The blood would be shed to cover the sins for a year. But he became the last sacrifice. The thing about it is, it doesn't end there. It doesn't end there. Jesus told them in Matthew 20, 28, he did not come to be served, but to serve. Our world today has got this backwards. The world today says, come serve me. The world today says to the individual, we lift you up. Everybody wants to talk about having a low self-esteem. I understand that. I'm the biggest, dirtiest, rotten sinner you've ever seen. By the way, you match me. It's not how good we are. Saved doesn't mean you're perfect. Never claim to be. I'm just saved by the perfect one. I'm cleansed. I'm cleansed by Him. I don't have to... You know, you know I'm going to sin every day. I'm going to come up short. I don't lose my salvation. I, I think that there are people that say, well, this sin, that's okay. That sin, no, that's not okay. That, that's a dirty, rotten sin. God, you've got to repent of that one over there. All sins need to be repented of. What God says is, I'll save you with an everlasting love. But He calls us to do something else. He calls us to serve. He calls us to serve, folks. Luke twenty two twenty four 24 says this, at that Lord's table in the upper room after they had had the meal Luke 22 24 says now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest can you believe that they had forgotten what Jesus had just done Moments earlier. Look in John chapter 13. Verse 1 says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that His hour had come, that He should depart from the world to the Father, having loved His own who were in the world, He loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that his father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, he rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a the towel with which he was girded. Did y'all catch that? The Son of God who stepped off the throne in heaven and stepped into humanity in Bethlehem, who humbled Himself for 30 years, and then at the appropriate time preached in love the truth and was treated so terribly and all he did was love. All he did was love. And his own disciples, when he gives them the bread and the cup, they begin to fight 
over which one of them they thought was the greatest. And moments earlier, he had gotten up and no one had done this. And they looked over and there was a basin of water by the door. And usually a servant would be there so when you came in, they would wash your feet when you came in the door. But no one had done that. So Jesus got up, gird his loins so he could bend down and took a towel and the King of Kings, the Lord of Eternity, washed feet. Dirty, stinking, ugly feet. Jesus answered, excuse me, then he came to Simon Peter, verse 6. Peter said to him, Lord, you are, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, what I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know that after this. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, I do, if I do not wash your feet, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, he who is bathed, that means who is saved, who is cleansed, needs only to wash his feet, that daily cleansing for the sins we've committed of the day. But is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him, therefore he said, you are not all clean. So when he had washed his, their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I, then your Lord, your master, your teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Church, I'm a Baptist. Can y'all forgive me for that? I was born a Baptist, and I'm still a Baptist. I'm a Baptist by choice now. I'm 61 years old. I've never done this before. If I don't do it right, I'm sorry. Come here, Ed. I could choose a whole bunch of people to do this. Would you sit down right there? Take your socks and shoes off. I uh, watched this man drive up in the parking lot every Sunday and open the back of his red truck. He had bought vegetables. And he just opened them up and said, uh, y'all just take whatever you want. Never ask a thing in for it. What a servant. Dynamite, come here. Deborah Palmer. Help decorate the church. She takes care of Mother's Day for us, Father's Day for us, Operation Christmas Child. She takes care of a orphanage up in North Carolina Children's Home. I think she's after the helping the dogs now, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> if you need a dog, she'll help you find one. She's rescuing dogs. I call her dynamite because dynamite always comes in a small package. Uh, she loves to love. And God gave her a heart of service. Clint, come here. 
Come here, Clint. Best greeter I ever met. I met him before New Holland. Every, take your socks and shoes off. I knew you were going to tell me that. <laughs> I'm not going to do it with your shoes on. <laughs> Clinton knows half the people in Hall County and Gwinnett County and Banks County. And, and every time he meets somebody, he loves on them. He serves them. Never asks for anything in return. Just loves on people. Jesus said, you will know they are my disciples by how they love one another. Take your socks and shoes off. Don't be like Peter. Yeah, I'm not going to wash your head. You know, I've, I've never done this. But I thought we had a picture today of baptism, the death, burial, and resurrection. And uh, we went through the picture of uh, Jesus' body being broken for ours. <laughs> and I thought, why don't we just show the picture? Now, I'm a Hairlip preacher. So don't think about, like they say when they sing a song, don't think about this person singing it. Think about the words. I can't wash everybody's feet up here. But I just want you to know that the Lord loves you. The Lord wants to wash your feet too. Every day He came to serve you. Oh, what a Savior we have. Shouldn't we serve Him? And if we serve Him, shouldn't we serve each other? He says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Put your feet in there, Ed. You've always been an encourager to me. You've never asked for anything. You just love. You just seek to do for others as Christ has done for you. You care. You matter. Raise those up, please. I love you, Ed. Jesus loves you more. Deborah, I appreciate so much that you do. Your feet don't even touch in here, do they? <laughs> Never one time have I asked you to do something for someone else and you've ever said no. It didn't matter who it was. It didn't matter what I asked. You were always there. But I know you weren't doing it just for any other reason. For weren't doing it for me. You were doing it because you have a Savior who loves you. Who died for you. Oh, and He's there for you. Thank you for serving. I love you. Thank you for all that you do. Clinton, oh, how you love people. People matter to you. You care. You can't fake that. And everybody knows it. Things of this world, they just kind of come. You've been through a hard life. You're the hardest worker I've ever seen. You never slow down. You all, even today, you brought me a gift and put it in my truck because that's who you are. You're a lover of people and you're a giver of people. You serve people. I thank you for knowing people's names. I thank you for taking them as they are 
and caring for them. I love you. I love you. Y'all can go back and take your shoes with you if you want. You can go to your seats. There's a picture in um, the book of Revelation. In chapter 5, it talks about needing a Savior. And it talks about who is worthy to come and be the Savior. And they look through all of heaven. They look through all of heaven. Who is worthy to come? Who is worthy to cleanse the sins of all humanity? It didn't look like anybody was worthy. It didn't look like anyone could come. And then there was one that stood up. And one that came forward. As though a lamb that had been slain. And he took the scroll. He paid the price. He made it happen. I'm not asking you to serve New Holland. I'm not asking you to serve me. I'm asking you to take up the, the love of Christ that He left within our hearts and to love each other. The hope of our future is the love that God placed within you. What will make a difference in this community is you take in that love and use it. Jesus said, not only will He come back to serve, but in Luke 12, 43, He said, Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when He comes. When He comes, Will He find us being served? Or will He find us serving? Will He find us arguing over who's going to be the greatest? Or will He find us washing each other's feet? In the last chapter of the Bible, in Revelation 22, verse 3, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. Listen to what's going to happen throughout all of eternity. And His servants shall serve Him. His servants shall serve Him. We get to practice down here what we'll have the pleasure of doing throughout all of eternity.